Getting into section 1.6, section 1.6 is all about this idea of continuity, which I've already thrown the word out a bunch. Talk about continuous and continuity a little bit already. So what it means is that in an intuitive sense, you can draw your graph on that particular interval without ever looking up the pit. So in an intuitive way of thinking about this, we have an interval A to B. What continuity intuitively is saying is that it doesn't matter what your function is doing. I mean, this isn't a function because I've already traced back on myself, but it doesn't matter what your function is doing. You can draw it without ever needing to look up. That's what continuity intuitively means. The way it is algebraically represented or recognized is by these three different definitions. You have to have that these conditions are true in order to say that a function is continuous on this particular interval. So what we're saying is Let's take an interval, A to B. Now let's pick a number, C, that is in this interval. If for every C, Inside of this interval, this, these three conditions hold up, then your function is continuous. If, however, one of them fails at at least one C, then we can say that your function is not continuous on that interval. You might say that it's continuous everywhere but at C, but it is not continuous throughout the entire interval. Make sense? So if this fails at one point, your function is no longer continuous in your interval. That said, you could say that your function is continuous everywhere, but at that point. Uh, oh, build up. Oh. A little bit of this intuition. Here are different examples of this kind of dudes. Not continuous at C1, because we just don't have a limit uh, in a value here, right? C1, this is the case of f of x at C1 is not equal to limit as x approaches c1 of f of x. You could also arguably say that it's this case. Right? So fsc is defined. While uh, our function is not defined, but that also means that it has to fail this third case. This is what I mean. C2, we have that the limit as x approaches C2 of our function does not exist. Why is that? Because coming at it from the left, 
our function approaches this value. So then we end up in the right, our function approaches this value. So the limits don't agree. So we say the limit doesn't exist, right? And then at C3, we have the case the limit as X approaches C3 of F of X does not equal what F of C3 is. So we're continuous in A to B everywhere except at C1, C2, C3. But we are not continuous in the interval A to B. Having said that, some good properties. No, every polynomial is going to be continuous. Every one. That's convenient. You see a polynomial, it's continuous everywhere. A rational function, however, will only be continuous in its domain. So, obvious question what's a rational function? A rational function is any fraction with a polynomial in its denominator. So a rational function is anything that looks like this. The numerator of x divided by a n x to the n plus one, x to the n minus one, plus that of that, plus a one, x one, plus a zero. So, a and are just coefficients, right? This one's in polynomial. So, rational function is anything with that sort of a polynomial in its denominator. Everybody cool with this? But it's continuous if there's a polynomial in its denominator? No. Okay. No. A polynomial is continuous. It's continuous. But if there's a polynomial in its denominator, yeah. It is not. It's not continuous. Okay. It's only continuous in its domain. Okay. So, okay. one way we can see this is that every polynomial, I'm going to do some shorthand notation really quick. It's funny, E just means you're going to add up everything from indexing, starting at N up to K. So I could rewrite something like N is equal to zero up to, actually, let me use J this time. J, CJ, this is going to be C0 plus C1 plus CK. That's all this notation is going to mean. So, a polynomial is anything that can be written in the form 
a n x to the n n equal to zero up to some k value. But a polynomial can be rewritten as the product of a bunch of small and polynomials, right? We've seen this in a bunch of different places with things like x squared plus 2x plus 1 is equal to x plus 1 quantity squared, right? So this is just this in another form. Makes sense what I mean? But if this is the case, and this thing is going to be equal to zero at all of our C values. Agreed? So, because of that, all rational functions are going to have discontinuities whenever our polynomial is equal to zero. So, it's going to have discontinuities at each of these C values. And that is why only in its domain is a rational function continuous. So this is how we also find the domain of that. One of the ways. Does this make sense to everybody? I know this is kind of a heavy way of explaining some things. I'm doing a lot of hand waving right now. Cool. So, two examples of polynomials x squared minus 2x plus 3 x cubed minus x. These are going to be just, uh, these are going to be continuous everywhere, right? Look pretty continuous everywhere to me. But notice when we put those polynomials in the denominator, when x is equal to zero, we have a discontinuity. When x is equal to one, that would discontinuity. That would discontinuity. Is x squared plus one ever zero? Right. So this last example is going to be continuous everywhere. Its domain is every possible real number. This function is going to be continuous everywhere except at one. Because its domain doesn't include one, right? This function, again, continuous everywhere except this time at zero. Because zero is the value of domain. So we're going to look at what it's like. We're just going to look at zero. It's not going to look at one. No, this is not going to be this. This is continuous in the interval, negative to infinity. And zero, sorry, negative to infinity to zero, and zero to infinity. This is continuous everywhere except that one. And then the last one is everywhere. So again, that first case, zero is not in the domain. So it's continuous everywhere but at zero. The second case, one's not in the domain. So it's continuous everywhere except at one. And in that final case, it's just continuous everywhere. 
Now, continuity on a closed interval, things start getting a little bit different. We have to talk in the case of a closed interval, it has to first be continuous in the open interval. And then it has to be continuous at the closed points. So, what is this whole thing of open intervals, closed intervals? That's the first question we should ask. Because I did do a lot of hand waving and I went over that notation the last slides. Start off with it. What we have here is a number line, right? No number line, it doesn't matter where it's at. All we know is we've got points A and points B. We're going to include every point between A and B, but not A and B. So you can get as close as you want to A, but you're not going to ever include it. You can get as close as you want to B, but you're not ever going to include it. This interval contains this. Contains every number in between the two, but not the two. We can write it in this interval notation, or we can write it using inequalities. Now, if we wanted to change this a little bit, let's say we want to include this point A, we we'll would write it using a square bracket. And x is greater than equal to a. Similarly, if we wanted to include b, we fill in this hole. Make the closing bracket a square bracket. And make it x is less than equal to b. And this holds for any graph. If I want to graph a function, leave out a point. Would you like that? I would be saying, ah, this is everywhere, but this one point. So down here, down here, let's say this is L, let's say this is C. Then our interval would be negative infinity to C. And C to infinity and beyond is buzz like here. He gets it. He's getting an A. Similarly, we would have the same thing up here, right? So this would be our domain. And up here, we would have a range, negative infinity to L and L to infinity. Now mathematicians like to use a particular notation. We don't like to use and. We instead like to use a U to represent the union of these two intervals. We're combining the two intervals without changing the values inside, right? Now let's compare that then to another graph.
Here, we can say that this function Talk about this being continuous inside of here, right? But on the closed interval C2 to C3, are we so continuous? That's the question. So on the closed interval, the first thing we have to do is check what's happening on the left end of our interval. Right? As we go to A, from the right, is our function equal to the width? Well, here, f at c2 is equal to l2, right? Which is, in fact, what the limit's equal to as well, isn't it? Agree? And over here, we have f at c3 is equal to l2. The limit from the left let me start with the limit from the right. Limit from the right. Is equal to the boundary point. And over here, we have the same thing happening over the limit from the left. So when we approach C2 from the left, our limit is going to come out to be L2, right? Well, that just so happens to be the same thing that our function value is out to be at C2. Similarly, at C3, our function value is out to be L2, but that also happens to be what the limit is as X approaches C3 from the left. So we would say in this interval, in this interval, we are continuous. Now let's look at the top part right here. When we approach C4 from the left, it comes out to be the same thing as our function at C4, right? But when we approach C3 from the left, or from the right, it is not the same thing as our function at C3. So on this interval, 
We're not continuous. We're not continuous. And C to C fold. In the closed interval. But we are continuous in the open interval. Like, what do you mean by the difference of what you're writing? Like, the bracket of what you, what you're going yeah. yeah, that's all the difference is. Because here, we're not including C3 and C4, but here, we are. Right? Yeah. So, we're continuous in between every value from C3 and C4, but not at C3 and C4. Now, coming down to here, we're continuous for every value between C2 and C3, and for C2 and C3. And then here we can choose for every value from C1 to C2, but not at C1 or C2. So we're not at C1 or C2. So we could be pedantic here. And say we're continuous in C3 up to and including C4, but not including C3. But at that point, you're being the game. Uh, does that make sense for you? Very many rules. Like I said, this was part of what I wanted to come back to with the domain and range stuff because I did hand wave over a lot of this notation knowing I was going to come back to it for this stuff. Um, so this is union. It means you're combining these two intervals without changing anything inside the interval, right? If we want to talk about a combination of two intervals, we would use the intersection. And what we would be saying here is you only want the values they both have. So this has two in it, but does not have three in it. This has two in it, it has three in it. So they both have two, but they don't both have three. They go all the way up to three. So just as another point, this is called the intersection. And the intersection of intervals. And now I'm throwing a lot all at once. Just to talk about continuity on closed intervals. But I think it helps to have this notation thrown in here now. So where is this thing continuous? Let's start by asking the question, what's the domain? What's the domain of the square root of the quantity three minus X? Can X be three? No. Can we take the square root of zero? Say what? Look. So f of x is equal to the square root of three minus x. In general, we have this rule here. 
square root of a thing, right? This thing has to be greater than or equal to zero. So our domain then is going to be three minus X greater than equal to zero. That means X is going to be greater than or equal to, I mean, less than or equal to three. Now writing this in interval notation, that is negative infinity up to three, agree? Right, so we have our domain. This is our interval we're gonna work with. Another way of thinking about this question. What do we think here? We need to check the limits, don't we? We know it's continuous everywhere in between because square roots are continuous everywhere. So we need to check the limits. As X approaches negative infinity from the right, looking over here, what happens when we approach negative infinity? Get infinity back out, right? We have three plus infinity, square root of infinity, plus infinity. Well, that's convenient because we're on an open interval at negative infinity anyhow, right? So, okay, cool. So negative, it's still infinity. Doesn't really tell us much here. Now let's check the other direction. The limit as X goes to three from the left. What do we approach? Zero, don't we? So we would say f of x is continuous in so just to show what this graph looks like. You can include three. You go all the way up. X goes to negative infinity. This is going to go up to infinity. And four. Buzz Lightyear was awesome. That Buzz Aldrin one seems to be.
So from our evaluation, notice they went ahead and just did evaluate at negative infinity. What was that? Negative infinity. That part of it. The other part is that this is both an interval. You didn't have that condition. You know that you're continuous for your entire domain is considered another rational type of function. Shouldn't call it that, but. Does this make sense to everyone? So did it got new? Say that maybe next week. Well, that's the reason why I asked. It's because I can clear up problems with this next one. This next one kind of does like what I was trying to say before with those examples. Here, got a monster. Question. Where do you continue with everybody? Well, that's what we should be, right? Here's the catch, because there is a catch. We have a polynomial from the interval negative one to two, a different polynomial on the interval two to three. So we need to check for these two up if they are actually equal. Does that make sense? What it means? So five minus two is going to be three. 3 squared minus, minus eight, 2 squared is 4 minus 1. Will be the it looks like, yeah, it is going to be continuous. Checking that cusp, that in between point, just evaluating what these functions would be if they could both be 2. It looks like it's going to be the same value. Checking it graphically. Looks like a judge. Now testing. Because these are all numbers, we know that in the <laughs> interval from negative one to two, that first polynomial is going to be. Similarly, that second inter that second interval from two to three, we know will be continuous everywhere in there. But what we don't know is that the limit is going to hold up with the two functions. And that's what we have to check. So checking, taking the limit from the left and the limit from the right, we both turn out to be so we'll limit it as x approaches 2 is 3. So we can say we are continuous from the interval negative 1 to 3, including negative 1 to 3. Usually we would say the interval negative 1 to 3 inclusive or the, the closed interval. There's a couple of different other ways you might say that. But is everybody cool with this? The only reason we needed to check that two point was because we didn't know for sure that these two polynomials were actually equivalent there. We could have had another jump discontinuity. Let's say instead of one, we had X, X squared minus X, then it wouldn't, right? Okay, so. The book uses some really weird notation here. I'm not the biggest fan. It uses this greatest integer function. And the greatest integer less than or equal to x is saying the, is the rounding down function. Or the floor function. So,
this thing is important. What it's doing, draw two graphs side by side to make this easier to picture. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. Six. What we're doing here is rounding down. So the next highest integer. This thing is weird. We should four function. They call it the greatest integer function. So on that thing, one of the first times I ever heard it called that. I read a research paper in number theory a while back. He had a book on the Lulon theta function. If this shows up all the time, we were calling it the greatest integer function. It's actually the four function. It's rounding things down to the next highest integer. So something cool tidbit of math. Something cool that happens. If you take the four function, take x minus the four function, get that graph, which I think is just really cool. It's a solitude function. It's a little bit of that. It shows up in a lot of cool places, like Fremont's hypothesis. Now, don't let this intimidate you. I'm going to be perfectly honest with y'all. First time I showed this to a class, I tried to sketch out the uh, graph, totally butchered it. Wasn't even close. Like these things were way off. It was bad. But what's happening here, what we can see just from looking at this, is this thing is going to be discontinuous, right? This floor function will force discontinuities all the time. It's one of the reasons why we like it. We can force all sorts of different discontinuities. What this thing is going to look like graphically. Have an open interval from zero up to 10,000. Another open interval from 10,000 up to wherever that is. Is it 20,000? And then another open interval from 20,000 up to 20,000. You're going to be open up a lot, close the room. And if you want to talk about continuity of this thing, you have to check the limits and compare them, right? If that makes some fun sense. So make sure it's safe. 
So I just really wanted to show you all more than anything else what this floor function is going to look like because it does show up in some of the homework problems, I think. Um, so if you want to sketch this graph, you would have to evaluate this out, round it down. Then apply your function. And that's why you have these discontinuities. What this thing's saying is that between one and 10,000, this is going to be zero. Between 10,001 and 20,000, it doesn't value it out one. So forth, so on. That makes sense, right? Subtract one from this. Then get 10,000 divided by 10,001. Okay. Take and round that down. So I'm going to round down to one. Now take 20,000, subtract one, get 19. 19999, right? Divide by 10, and we get 1.99999. Round that down to next highest integer below, right? So round down to one. So when grabbing these things, you're going to have to do it step by step by step according to the intervals that these four functions round down. And then once you get that, say, all right, well, here, throw a zero in. This is just going to come out to be one plus zero, that 20 times 5,000 plus 3x. So in this interval, it acts like this. Now, we replace this with one. So in this interval, it acts like 5,000 times two, so 10,000 plus 3x. Does this make sense? In that case, let's get into the next chapter of stuff. Course materials. All right, so exam one will be next week. I should point that out. Um, week two homework will be due next Wednesday. It is already posted. It is a longer assignment, so go ahead and get started. It's probably the longest we're going to have all semester. How many questions is it? 42. So six a day. Now, What? Are we taking a break now? No, no, no. Wait. No, no, no. Did we skip week three? On the this does because the way my the way my class worked out last semester, that was right when we had that week off because of the snow. Oh, okay. So it was just like let's call it week four. Um, okay. But what we're going to be talking about is an application of the limit. And it's going to give us what's called the derivative. But before we can talk about the derivative, we need to talk about what's called the secant line and a tangent line. So secant, like I say in the notes, the word secant is derived from the Latin word for to cut. So intuitively, a secant line should cut a curve in at least two places. It's going to cut. So as an example, let me see that line. Let's consider the graph x squared. And 
And let's take the line from zero up to, let's say, two, four. This is an example of a secant one. Just cut our function in two parts. Now, let's fix this point. We're going to hold that point there. We're going to choose another point down here. Let's say 1, 1. Another secret one. So this is obviously not drawn to scale. X equal to one. X equal to two. Delta X is equal to one. One. Y is equal to one. Y. Delta Y is equal to so. If I wanted to know we call this line one. We call this line two. If I want to know the slope of line one. Well, that's going to be equal to our function at two minus our function at zero divided by two minus zero, right? So that's the x dot one. All I did was write this as y two. This is y one. Three. This is x one or x two. This is x one. That gives us the slope of that one. Yeah. This is going to be equal to plus two minus zero, right? On the bottom. Yes. Yes. So this thing's going to be equal to four minus zero over two minus zero, or just two. Yeah. Two squared. Oh, it's squared. Okay. Our function is x squared here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I didn't know what squared, so that's why. Where would the square go? So now line two. Line two has a slope equal to f at one minus f at zero divided by one minus zero, or one minus zero divided by one minus zero, or just one. But I want you to notice for a second. We can rewrite this, couldn't we? Let's 
We can rewrite. L2 in terms of L1 by talking about delta x and delta y. This is not going to be a common notation that we're going to use in this particular way, but we will use it later on down the road. And that's why I want to show you all this right now. Same thing, is it? It's a weird notation, but it, it means the same. Delta x is the distance between x equal to two, x equal to one. Two minus delta x. Well, delta x is one. Two minus one is zero. Well, so what I should write here is actually So I want us to start thinking about defining functions based on a fixed point. Right now, I'm not fixing the point that we're going to use later on in the road, that road, but this sort of logic will help us elsewhere. Now, what if, what if we change this around? What if we compare instead of to this point, this? So instead of delta x being the distance between or change in x is the distance between this. What does that change to? Does it? Our answers should still be the same. We're just going to get things look a little bit different, right? Agree? So, just to get us going, we've got this idea of the secret line. Secret line, if we fix an x value and go some change in x, right, then the change in the height of our secret line is going to be f of x plus delta x minus f of x. So similar to what we have, not exactly the same. So it takes a different point than what they did. But it gets us going. Then the slope of this secant line here is going to be f of x plus delta x minus f of x divided by delta x. You all agree on this? What happens? In this top case, in this case, okay, I fix this and drag this point all the way down and let it get close. What happens to our secret line? Our secret line is going to kind of move like this, right? Until it just touches our function at a single point. A line that touches a function at a single point. The tangent that lies tangent to your function. So, given two or more points, yada, yada, yada. I've already shown this. Um, I'm going to come back to this next class. That's one of the reasons why I'm like, yada, yada, yada. Just want to give y'all a cursory overview of what we're going to be talking about. So, now we've got what's called a tangent line. And this is what happens when you take. One of these points fixes them, fix them, and drag the other one down. Okay. 
of a tangent. The tangent, well, the word tangent comes from the Latin to touch. And what we're really seeing here, if we were to zoom in on this point and keep zooming in and keep zooming in and keep zooming in, and the resolution didn't get all crazy. What we would find is that this tangent line eventually becomes indistinguishable from our function. Because for really small changes of x, immediately around here, really small changes of x, this tangent line and our function are effectively parallel. They're not parallel, but for a very small value or very small bubble or ball of x's, they're effectively, it's your effect. So, so similar to a one parallel, one transcend. Does that make sense for me? This tangent line is a very, very special slope. Its slope is going to be the slope of a secant line when delta x goes to zero, isn't it? So let's look at what's happening. The way they're defining everything is a little bit different than what I did up here. They're defining their delta x compared to their fixed point, right? We're saying, okay, in the first case, your slope is going to be f of zero plus delta x one minus f at zero divided by delta x one. And in the second case, it's going to be f at zero plus delta x two minus f at zero divided by delta x two three. Here, that delta x one is equal to two. Is greater than delta x two, which is equal to one. Now I ask the question: What happens when you take delta x to zero? We all think happens. And that would effectively be the same thing as. Does that have an answer? It's not set delta x to zero because then you have zero down to the low. Yeah, right. but don't we have tricks to handle that? Well, yeah, but so right off the bat, you can find the trick. Let's work on this really quick. So what we've got is our function is defined to be x squared. So f of zero plus delta x 
is going to be zero plus delta x, that quantity squared, or just delta x squared, right? F at zero, well, that's just zero squared, that's zero. So, F zero plus delta X minus F at zero divided by delta X. Let's go ahead and apply the limit as delta X goes to zero. So this is going to end up being delta X squared over delta X, isn't it? Yeah. With the limit, of course. Limit delta x goes to zero. Delta x squared with delta x. But this thing simplifies. It simplifies to the limit as delta x goes to zero. Delta x, right? And that's just zero. So the slope of the tangent line to x squared at zero, at x equals zero, is just going to have a slope of zero. It's going to be the straight line parallel with our x axis. Looking at this graph really quick, you can see that that line representing the power x axis does, in fact, only touch our parabola in one spot. Right? And if you were to zoom in really close, our parabola. Look something like this, zoomed in where it was, right? Zoomed in closer, it would look flatter, 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 right? I argue that what you just found, what we just found, is a very important tool in mathematics. In fact, it's going to be the tool that we use for half of this class. This is called the derivative, what we just found. This is a derivative at a particular point. The derivative is the slope of the line tangent to your function at a point. You think of the derivative in an intuitive way as representing the slope of your function at a point. Really, what's happening is the tangent line at your function, or at that of the tangent line at that point of your function as the slope equal to the derivative. But we can think of it in this other intuitive way. Does this make some sense? Yeah, so we're gonna come back to this next class and I'm gonna walk more thoroughly through all of this. I'm also going to show a visual kind of like what I did before to help explain kind of what some of this means. Having said that, y'all are free to go. Have a good get, uh, good day, everybody. A good gate. <laughs>